Okay, what's coming up? When God's word announces judgment against both clergy and people, how shall we respond? Hi, this is Pastor Ken Larson, Visitation Pastor, Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida. And we are glad that you are with us. We invite you to worship with us on Sundays at 1030 or at 830, two options, or you can also worship online anytime, anytime at trinitydelray.org and look for the services posted there. You could also watch this Bible study anytime by going to YouTube and searching for Pastor Larson's Bible study. That's me, Pastor Larson, and I am glad to be your host and uh, your leader for the time being, all right? That's good. Let's go then and get into it. Though this book of Malachi that we're studying was written centuries ago, we're finding connections between this book and today's pastors and churchgoers. And I think that is necessary when we study the book of the Bible that we find the application to be the present day application. Otherwise, it's God's history, important, but people want to know, what does that have to do with me? Well, let's find out. First of all, we need to know who's talking. Well, God is talking through the prophet Malachi, and he is talking to someone. He's talking to a whole group of people. So we need to know to whom does God address himself through the prophet Malachi. First of all, he's talking to the priests who have returned with the remnant from that 70-year captivity in Babylonia. It's been a long time, and they have come <laughs> back with God's people. God has issues with the priests. He would think they would get a fresh start. But no, they are in the wrong. God says you have permitted and conducted false worship in which you do not honor God. You're not teaching the word of God. You have been accepting sacrifices on my altar that are not pure and clean, inferior sacrifices, wounded and sick animals animals with blemishes, and I told you to bring an unblemished sacrifice, and you disrespect the temple and the way you treat it and not keep it up to date. You're breaking the Sabbath, and you're permitting the people to break the Sabbath. You can make an application, but I'm not ready to do that yet, okay? God has <laughs> issues with the people. And in particular, you can read about the issues that God has with the people in detail in Nehemiah, Nehemiah 13. Mm -hmm. And I have said to you before, and I'll say it again, for background, it would be good for you to also be reading the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah. Mm -hmm. All right? They're, they're not very long. You can read each of them in less than an hour, maybe much less. So if you are curious, and I want to make you curious enough to look in there to see what it is, at least look at Nehemiah 13, all right? And these are the, the issues that God has with his people. The offerings were down. They were bringing inferior sacrifices, not only the financial sacrifices, but their lives were inferior, that is, they were not living up to the word of God. Hmm. So not only were the priests offering these sacrifices, these were the only sacrifices that the people were bringing. So the sin was participatory on the part of the priests allowing it. The people were intermarrying with the heathen. That had been forbidden from the beginning. The people of Israel were to separate themselves and never, ever marry someone who was not of that nation. That sounds, that sounds weird to our ears today, but if you read 1 Corinthians 6, you may find 
an echo of this in the New Testament. I'm not going to study with you today what happens when someone who is a Christian marries someone who is not a Christian. You've seen it happen, and maybe it's happened in your own lives. Yes. My personal story, if you allow that brief, <laughs> and I think good tangent, we spent four wonderful days with my good friend. I've known him since 1957. And when I knew him first, he was not a Christian. I introduced him to a young girl through, uh, through something I think that God arranged. Hmm. He married her. And they have been married the same number of years that Janie and I have been married. You, you know that through that marriage, God brought my good friend to believe in Jesus Christ. And he became a teacher and a leader in the various churches that they have been attending. And so it is with special joy that I see this exception, <laughs> as it were, because her father did not want her to marry a man who was not a Christian, but he allowed it. And God made it good. First Peter three is the reference. If you have an unbelieving husband, mm -hmm. then treat him this way. And she did. I told you it was a useful tangent because it <laughs> is a story of God working in the lives of people. So the Israelites still were were having this rule, this law, don't marry someone who is not of the Israelite race. The people were breaking the Sabbath, and of course the priests were allowing it because they were breaking the Sabbath as well, and the people were neglecting the house of God, its maintenance and its reconstruction. So we can make some applications right away, I believe, uh, how are these issues current today? And I've told you one. Now, and look at that list. Look at that. How are these things happening today? Well, I think uh, I think churches, many churches, are all suffering with the offerings being down because of, especially this past, especially the past year with the pandemic and people losing jobs and uh, not working as much and not even coming to church, and as a result, not sending in an offering and those sorts of things. Uh, That's true. Um, I, I've heard from pastor that that has not been a problem at Trinity. Yeah, we've been uh, blessed. Yeah. Any other applications that are current? The whole list. Pardon? The whole list. Yeah, yeah the whole list is, yeah. Yeah. I guess it would be the whole list. <laughs> well, these things go on, and God is not happy. No. No, no. And, and we should not treat these sins as something light, and no, it doesn't matter. And um, we can get along and just do... Uh, <laughs> to, to break the Sabbath in our day is to neglect God's mm -hmm. word, to disrespect God's word. And, and the, the pastor wants you in church because it's God's will to the extent that you are able, illness and, and uh, quarantine uh, exceptions, of course, to be in worship. It's, it's not an option to mm -hmm. neglect the study of God's word. And that's how we keep the Sabbath in our day. All right. That's, that's true. This Malachi, Malachi introduction has another question for you. Go back to that time, 2,400 years ago. Mm -hmm. How could the people of God have gone so far astray? 
Well, we were talking last week, I think that it was something like 400 years before Christ came. Yes. Well, waiting 400 years, I mean, you can wait a year and get off the path. You can wait a couple months and get off the path, but 400 years might have really got them off the path of, uh, of waiting for Christ and wondering if it was going to really happen, I would think, you know, let alone the day-to-day -day sacrifices. Of course, they didn't know it was 400 years. Uh, yeah. They didn't have a prediction that was that accurate. Yeah. Um, Malachi says that it, the, the Savior would come, using different words. <laughs> they had ignored the voice of God through the prophets for centuries already. The 600 years that I mentioned last time between the first prophet and Malachi uh, they would continually go astray, even right. though they had God's word. Mm. I think it's human nature, human nature. Like you take uh, even, I'm not an example of this really, but in the sense of you have children and one or two of them are not going to follow and go astray. They may come back, you know, the prodigal son thing, but they may not too. And so it, it builds up. And pretty soon you have a, a bad situation. Yeah, uh, parental supervision from the from the year one on, uh, and and not uh, giving an example as well as bringing the children to God's house. That's that's a long thing, and people go astray by their own disobedient will. Yeah. And I, when uh, now, now, dear class, <laughs> I have been with you many years. And when someone says human nature, what do I usually say? Oh, sinful nature. Sinful nature. Right. I mean, we, we are all sinful. No. Right. So, what do you think happened? Maybe they didn't have enough prophets or people people following the prophets at least to keep preaching God's law to the people. So it was easier for them to go astray, not being able to listen and hear the word. They had, a, go ahead. But I want to say they had opportunities in the three festivals to remember what God had done and the example of his love and rescue and so forth, his mercy. And also they had the synagogues. They had the ability, the opportunity. So why do you think that happened? Isaiah 53, verse 6. This is what I was leading to when you mentioned human nature. Uh, <laughs> um, so I'll ask Christine to, to read it, if you will. Okay. Isaiah 53, 6. Um, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Well, we've got the bad news and the good news there. Yep. <laughs> the law and the gospel. We will always be like sheep who go astray. Our righteousness that most of us think we're pretty good. I've said that before. But we have turned everyone to his own way. Every day we have our way. That's what children want. They want to have their way. That's right. what the people of the world insist upon. <clears throat> the good news is that the Lord laid on Jesus Christ our iniquity. In Isaiah 53, you know it well, is the prediction of a savior who would come and suffer in our place for us instead of us the gospel of jesus christ is always there return to the lord repent and seek his face of mercy pray to him in faith in that savior so we're doing that we're doing that not just on Sunday, but every time we open God's word, every time we pray, 
Sin, as a result of uh, our study of God's word, we know that sin is our condition. Not just what we do, but our, our condition, our nature, as you said, our human nature perverted by the sin we have inherited. We sin because we are sinners, and this condition remains. We still need God's prophetic word. And the New Testament has his prophetic word. We call those people apostles. The Lord called them apostles. But it is still a prophetic word because it announces God's way and his word to us, and it's for us. It's God's will that we hear the law and repent. We are called to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ, and we go on our way rejoicing. Why did the people during the exile go so far astray? There is a partial, partial reason given in Jeremiah 29. Uh, Judy, would you read Jeremiah 29 and um, be aware that there's a second page to this? Okay. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylonia, Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. Mm. Interesting, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The false right. prophets were turning the people away from God's word. Mm -hmm. Well, we see that today. Mm -hmm. right? I have a dream. Now, I'm not attacking a, a civil rights leader no. of the 60s when I say that. No. A, a dream is a, is, a, is a plan. Now, I know and you know when God had intervened in the lives of people and he gave them a dream and he told them that that dream was from him. Right. right? It was not, there was no question. And one of my private beliefs, and I can't teach this as, a, as the word of God, but sometimes I wonder, well, why did why does God let us dream today? I have dreams and they, they, I mean, when I sleep and when I awake, they puff like uh, it's gone. And I very seldom remember a dream. So here's my, my thought, and you can take this or leave it. I think God gives us dreams so that when we read about dreams in the Bible, we'll understand what it is. But hmm. most of our dreams are just like so much smoke. They puff and they blow away and they have no meaning. I do not seek the meaning of my dreams. Well, I also think, you know, we're speaking of dreams that occur when we sleep, but people have daydreams of what they want to also do uh, yeah. and sometimes change uh, in their lives. I, they do. And, and I can't interpret those and I can't tell someone they didn't have that because I didn't experience it. And it's right. also true in the Old Testament that God spoke to them in visions. Right. Sometimes uh, directly, Correct. Yeah. as with Moses in the, in the burning bush. So God has his way of puncturing through, uh, um, let's say the mantle that covers the sky and uh, reaching into a life or several lives and saying, here's what I want you to do. Well, my point of giving you this passage from, Mal from Jeremiah 29 
mm-hmm. is to let you know that God had a plan for them. By the way, if they hadn't taken sons and daughters and given their daughters in marriage and new children born, then where would the remnant have come from? They were 70 years. Do you realize in, in a couple more generations, they would have been all gone. Mm-hmm. And most of the people or many of the people who went into exile did not return. They, they died in Babylonia. Okay. Well, that's all I wanted to do is to bring up this idea that they had false teachers to lead them astray and they should have fired them <laughs> or ignored <laughs> them. All right. Now you've got the lesson, don't you? So why did the people in, during the exile go so far astray? Well, they listened to the false prophets, some of them. Now, before I mention some special features of Malachi, I'm going to read, repeat a couple of them. One of, of them that uh, you will recognize right away is it's a dialogue in about six or seven places. You say, but the Lord says. So what the people were saying, the Lord knew what they were saying, didn't he? What you say is wrong. The Lord says this. You see an echo of that when Jesus is preaching the Sermon on the Mount. You have read that it says, but I say to you. So he was reinterpreting and reapplying the Old Testament to the people of his day. Right. Was Jesus a prophet? You never think of that, but there is a prophetic office to Jesus' time. And that remains because his word, his prophetic word remains there in the New Testament. Remains true. Now, God says, I'm not pleased with that. I'm not pleased with your argument, your argument ways. You, you keep going contrary to me. And then when I tell you something, you're like children. I'm not pleased with that. Right. That's the way it is. You can hear a hundred <laughs> sermons. And in one of them, you learn that I'm not supposed to do this, but you do it anyway. So the proclamation in Malachi is like every other part of the word of God. There are warnings and there are promises. Hmm. But the law is, is the warning and the promise is the gospel. The gospel in the general sense, I will be with you, I will care for you, I will provide for you. Look at what I have done for people in the past, I will do it also for you. I am not going away, I am I'm the permanent God, I'm the real God. All right? I, I want you to all cling to that. And don't listen to the voices that come against God. A little bit more of the introduction. God has messengers in every age, right? The warning is, if you sin, here are the consequences. It's kind of like a parent, right? If you do this again, I want to tell you what's going to happen. Right? It's fair for God to know, to tell us, so that we know the consequences, beginning with the proper fear of God. He is able and he is willing to punish. There will be consequences, but he is also full of mercy and long suffering. And he wants to rescue you from your disobedience. He wants a great life for you. And the great life is living in the fear of God with knowledge of his, his present and, and future will. I'm trying to keep it in this summary, in as few words as possible. There is the repentance. Turn 180 degrees from your sin and do the opposite of what you're doing. Hear the gospel. When Jesus says, I forgive you, you are forgiven. The sanctification life is that which follows your response to the gospel is you don't neglect worship and you love one another as God and Christ has loved you. 
You give and you care and you serve with all your might. You don't hold back from doing good. When you see an opportunity, you do it. Now, some, some questions. I have talked for quite a while here. Um, it's your turn. How do we respond? Reflection on ourselves and if we are doing that. What was that first word? I couldn't hear. Reflection Re on ourselves. Reflection. Yeah. Uh-huh. Look in the mirror. <laughs> yeah. Well, my my answer, and I think it is yours, with repentance. Yeah. Right. Ask for forgiveness. In whom have we put our trust for that forgiveness? In Christ our yeah. Lord. Yeah. In Christ and in him alone. Then, when we have sinned, we confess our sins to one another. I'm talking about a, a personal sin. One of the things that people say all the time is when someone is offended, the other person, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the person offended says, oh, it's all right. No, it's not all right. It's, I forgive you. <laughs> I'm not talking about bumping into someone and say, oh, I'm sorry. Or that's all right, okay. But a, a a real sin. This is personal. Confess. Sometimes it's hard, isn't it? I sinned against yep. you. Any examples? An example from your life or the life of someone you know? Uh, the Ten Commandments would like, you know, all uh, breaking one of them and, and uh, in the sense of women gossip. Okay. Uh, about a relationship between you and someone. That messes it up. Yeah. Stop there. So how do you bring about a, a transaction in which one person forgives another one. Uh, I, I think maybe if you know if we um, if we were insistent on doing a particular action, we were just so sure you had to do something a certain way, and then found out later on it was not the right way, or it was uh, or you or you associated with somebody you shouldn't have associated with, and you led that friend of yours down the same path with you. Um, it'd be necessary to sit down, first of all, to just talk with them and let them know that you made the mistake of going in the wrong direction and needed to change. And you were sorry that you brought them along with you with your insistence that it was the right way, because sometimes we can get pretty headstrong about our way is the right way. And uh, uh, then, you know, and then ask them for forgiveness that we uh, that we took them down the wrong path or. All right, good example. But the big thing I think is to talk about it um, too and not, not just throw out there, oh, I forgive you. Yeah, um, you have to confess. Which, yeah, which is real easy to do. Uh, and it sometimes becomes almost meaningless because we say, oh, I forgive you. But then really deep down, we still carry the grudge or we still carry it with us. Uh, we need to really let them know how we, truly feel and conf and like uh, Dee said, we really need to confess it to them. Take some time, sit yeah. down, mm -hmm. uh, be face to face mm -hmm. and be sincere. Yes. And when we forgive, well, forgiven people forgive. They know what it means. They know what it costs. It does cost you to forgive. You let go of something. Your righteousness is valuable to you. And you don't want to let go of this perfection that you dream that you have. When you ask for forgiveness, you're saying, I don't measure up and I'm sorry. I am very sorry. 
Now, if you want, you can promise not to do it again. <laughs> if you say that too many times, the people stop believing. Mm -hmm. You show evidence of repentance. You also open up a can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> Are you willing to do that? Yeah, that's right. That's well, I, and your, evid your evidence of repentance is if, like we just said, you don't keep repeating the same offense over and over and over again. Yeah. Uh, you fall back and, and you know, by, by your actions, I guess, uh, in what you do. Uh, if you ask for forgiveness and you go back to your old ways again and it keeps happening and cyc cycling, you know, it's not really showing that sincerity. Yeah. That we really meant it. And again, sometimes it's hard. We do, you know, we humanly do slide and that's where we need the help of our fellow Christians also sometimes and ask them for help. When you see me sliding, catch me or whatever. The yes. <laughs> and to believe the gospel. You don't have to carry your sin around for the rest of your life. You can give it to your savior and ask him for forgiveness for that particular sin that you know in, in your heart. And he listens to that and to believe that he forgives. Live a life of freedom in his kingdom. You and I have so much freedom in this Christian life. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about national freedom, of the kind in the Declaration of Independence, uh, the Constitution. I'm talking about the the freedom in the gospel to be God's person and to say, I'm, I have been freed from the dominion of all of the things that are wrong and the freed, and I've been freed from this slavish um, belief that I, I can get my righteousness through obedience to the law. The book of Galatians, I would love to study that with you. Freedom in the gospel. But, but, <laughs> as, soon as, I, as soon as I talk about this freedom, I say, but do not let your freedom and do not use your freedom, I'm sorry, as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. What does that mean? I yes. was going to ask you. <laughs> freedom as an opportunity for the flesh the, the flesh is the part of us that wants to do wrong okay the sinful flesh maybe just oh. maybe just <laughs> oh dear i am sorry about that i'm supposed to turn my phone off during bible class and worship uh oh and um i cannot uh, i just vowed that i would not interrupt for anything do not let your freedom don't use it here i'm going to i'm going to add to this what does that mean of course is what i was asking you the gospel is not a free pass to continue in sins of neglect or hmm. sins of commission you see if i say well i sinned on monday and saturday but it was okay because I went to church and I got forgiven and <laughs> and now I've got a free uh, I'm free and on Monday I'm I'm gonna do that again. And how can you say that to God? How can a child who says I'm sorry on Sunday and receives forgiveness from the parent say on Monday, huh, I'm sneaking out after eleven because me and my buddies are going to uh, go find a six pack and um, have some fun. See, well, that's just my example. But, no, but I'm laughing because I can relate back to my teenage years. Oh, really? <laughs> or, or, you know, similar. <laughs> All right. This confession is good for the soul. Everybody else is fine. Confession and also. Um, when I was in nurses training, you know, that that same thing used to happen because I went to a Catholic school of nursing. So on Sunday night, the girls that were Catholic would go to church 
And then they would go out, we would go out to this local beer bars in Wisconsin and uh, entertain, <laughs> entertain ourselves afterwards. And then it was okay once you had gone to church. <laughs> You know, and that was the that was the mental attitude that that there was, unfortunately. You know, and sometimes maybe the wrong thing gets taught too, but uh, that's not what to, happened. Not to bring another religion in it, but I will. Um, I, I believe a lot in the past that Catholic people felt that way when they went to confession. Mm -hmm. Did it again and again, but they were okay. <laughs> Well, I, I, uh, I think that it was never meant as a free pass to sin again. Oh. Repent and sin no more, I think, is what Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery. Uh -huh. It wasn't a free pass to continue her sinful life. The gospel is not a free pass to continue in the <laughs> sins of neglecting God's word and to go against it. So what should we expect? It sounds like a jarring uh, non-transition. <laughs> what should we expect of those who serve at the altar as priests or pastors? In other words, we're talking about pastors in our day. What do we expect of them? Should we? Well, we should expect examples, but we also have to remember, uh, you know, we can't say they're perfect because only God is perfect. They're, they are no different in many ways than we are um, yes. because they are human beings and they're also sinful human beings. That's uh, right. Yeah. But, they, but they've many times been, because of their occupation and their vows that they take, have been held to, uh, I know I've heard pastors say they've been held to a higher uh, mm -hmm. order, you know, just like we as nurses take an oath to be held to what we do in medicine. Yeah, you're, we're all we all take oaths. Of, uh, some of them are formal, and some are informal. Yeah. But here, I want you to turn your thoughts to what a, a pastor does, um, on as as called by God mm -hmm. to His people. They compared to the false prophets, he is expected to preach the word of God in its truth and purity. Mm -hmm. And we hold them to that standard because God holds them to that standard. We all stand as pastor demonstrates when he kneels with us for confession, right? Correct. That's a demonstration. He wouldn't have to do that. I also did that when I was full-time pastor and leading all the worship. I, I would kneel with the people and... Uh, Right. The difference is a pastor does not hear the declaration. He speaks it. And so when pastors get together at conferences, we have worship so we can receive that same declaration. Mm -hmm. That's what we expect. So what if we are afraid? Malachi says the evil will not prevail. And this is a good message for us today. The good news is coming. In fact, it has come. Who will read this? Uh, Evelyn? Behold, I sent my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Malachi 3, verse 1. The prophecy of Jesus Mm -hmm. The messenger is going to come. Right. He'll suddenly come to his temple. All right. That'll happen 30 years after he is born. He's coming. And this is what you said before. They had to wait 400 years, but they didn't know it would be 400 years. So each generation told the next generation. Malachi's book was written down. And we don't know in de detail. You can read the history um, through Josephus and others to see how that uh, was done. It is amazing that a remnant remained when Jesus came on the scene. We're still waiting for him to come back. That's right. Huh? He will come suddenly in glory. 
another thing we could study. So the good news is that <laughs> Jesus has come and will come again. Let's jump into Malachi chapter 1 without any other transition. Verse 1, the oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. My question is, what is an oracle? <laughs> uh. What is an oracle? It's not a prophecy. I think it's, is it like a note or just something? Uh, a what? A note or a note of uh, information. I don't think it's a prophecy. Um, look at the first three letters and think of your nurse's training. Uh -huh. It's oral. It's spoken. Something. That's right. Yeah. Um, it was spoken first and then written down, but it is a speech. It is a proclamation. Thank you. All right. And then we go into verse 2. And uh, Dee, would you read this? Verse 2. I have loved you, said the Lord. But you say, how have you loved us? Is not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yes, I have loved Jacob. But Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to jackals of the desert. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's like a, a broadside. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> that's, that's real hate. <laughs> We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that right now. God declares his love, but the people ask insolently, disrespectfully, how have you loved us? What? What's the answer? What was the answer? The Lord says, is not Esau Jacob's brother? Yeah. Now, he is speaking to descendants of Jacob. Right. Not He is not speaking to descendants of Esau, who is also no, named, uh, known as Edom, E-D-O-M. Okay. But I loved Jacob. But Esau, I have hated. They were twin brothers. <clears throat> Jacob followed the Lord, and Esau went the other direction. Right. Okay. So that was the answer. I have loved Jacob. Look at was hap look at look what has happened to Esau's descendants. It's a relative hate, not the hatred that we would never associate with God, other than his hatred of sin. Right. So is this common today that people will speak insolently to God and say, oh, how have you loved us? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Why would people say that? They didn't get their way. <laughs> that, that's certainly it. All right, so what comparison doesn't God present? The comparison between how Jacob has been treated over the centuries and Esau's descendants. Now Esau, his descendants were able to find a place to live, and we're going to show that, uh, but they didn't follow the Lord. So the, I have to explain and what you already know that the word hatred here is a relative comparison. Who hasn't read yet this morning? Everybody? Yeah. Huh? Everyone? I think, I think yeah, those of us that are here. Uh, okay. Uh, 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 oops, I can't do that. Uh, Patty Gaither? Back, oh, she's not in her seat. Back to uh, uh, Judy. Luke okay. 14, 20 it, Hatred is a relative comparison. See Luke 14, 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Well, <laughs> you, you understand, don't you? That the hatred is a relative thing. 
you love God above all people and things. But that doesn't mean you don't love those other people and things and take care of them as you are called to do. And to hate your own life is not to try to destroy it, but in comparison with how you love God. No, I, I love life, and I think, I've said this before, I sometimes love life a little too much. <laughs> I don't get to stay here. Because it, it is like, maybe there's a bunch of double negatives in there. I, I don't really get it. It's a relative let me try to paraphrase it, and I won't be totally accurate, but this I hope this would help. If anyone comes to me and does not love me a whole lot more than father and mother and wife, does that help? Like you said, we're... the way you say it, it makes sense, <laughs> but, but he uses the word hate, and that, you know, that throws them know. off. Yes. But you see, when, when Jesus speaks, he is not mincing words. He's not saying, let me soft pedal this because they'll probably blown, be blown out of the water by this. <laughs> we are. <laughs> so he states it in such stark terms that we cannot fail to get the message that God is first. There is no one else at his, on his plane. And everything else and everyone else is below him. So okay. in a relative sense, mm -hmm. it is not the hatred which seeks evil of a person or mm -hmm. finds a way to hurt them. It is not a hatred that is the, the kind that is forbidden. Jesus does make the comparison that when you hate someone, it's the same as murder. And he would, he, he would never say it's that kind of hatred. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And I hope that helps. There are many difficult sayings of Jesus. You can find a book that puts them all in one place. And if you want to tie yourself up in knots, go and read such a book and or go through the New Testament and find them all. Yeah. Okay, I'm being facetious. You wouldn't do that. But do you understand that how much Jesus loves you? He would never get you to in any way to to say to your well, your father and your mother and my in most of your cases I think are with him in heaven oh dear how do I else do I say this let's uh, let's talk on uh, people who are, are are still here my wife I can't I can't hate her in any sense of the term except compared to Jesus. If I put my wife above Jesus, oh, that's... okay, now it might be one thing to say to, G to, to, say to Jeannie on a, on a Friday night, and I almost said it last night, um, maybe you can find a movie because I need to go and study and get ready for Saturday. Mm -hmm. I said that, but I changed my mind, and I studied this morning. That's okay. The Lord provided the opportunity and the means and the time and all right. Okay. But you see what I mean that I if I if I continually there are pastors who marry the church. And they have and their wives are, are widows. You stay home, take care of the kids, make make the food, I'll be home at six o'clock and I want dinner on the table and I have to go back to church at 7.30 because I have a meeting or I have a counseling appointment and I have to get up tomorrow early because I had to get all the way up to so-and-so and it takes uh, 45 minutes. So, um, and I won't be home until, well, listen, I'm going to get my own supper because I have a meeting so close to that. You, uh, well, um, go to bed without me and um, I'll see you in the morning. <laughs> now, Here's what they said in seminary to us. Don't marry the church. She already has a bridegroom. Mm. Okay. You get it? Yeah. Her bridegroom is Christ. Christ. You serve the church, but you don't marry her. Um, maybe I'm being too vociferous about it, but I remember that lesson. Now you ask Jeannie, please don't. I mean, in the early years, whether I was so devoted 
and so afraid of not doing all I could for the church that I didn't spend much time with her or the children. Well, I think even as members, sometimes one can get involved, one can get more involved than the other. <laughs> and <laughs> yes, same, uh, same thing can happen to it, like I said, to a church member and, and ignore and um, not take care of your family. I'm glad you brought that up because it brings Luke 14, 26 back to everyone in, in the church. Mm -hmm. Don't marry the church. Once in a while, you can say no. And five, number five, in 553 BC, around there, Edom had been destroyed, but Judah remained. So in that sense, he had, relatively speaking, hated Edom, that is Esau, and all the descendants who settled there. But Judah remained. There was, a, a, in Judah, there were unbelievers and some believers. I don't know the proportion. The Bible doesn't tell us. All right, let's go on. As I said before, Edom, E-D-O-M, is another name for Esau, and the word means red, and you remember how he came out red, and that's why he was given that name. <clears throat> Esau's descendants settled in a land called after his name, Edom, and they were called the Edomites. You'll read about them in the Old Testament. So what will happen to Edom? Well, we'll see in verses 4 to 5, I guess you already have. But first, I want to give you a map to tell you where Edom was. Here's Judah. And oh. Israel was up here, but it had oh. been taken in. Pardon? I'm just sitting here saying that it's down where Petra is, which is nothing but red rock. <laughs> You've been there. Mm -hmm. a lot of, <laughs> Petra means rock. <laughs> That's yeah. why it was named that. It is. So that the country of Edom uh, was where they settled, and it oh. was not part of Judah or Israel. Got it? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to give you a map that is an approximation to the same place now. Yeah, today it's Jordan. Today it's part of Jordan. Jordan and a little bit of southern Israel, Israel. Uh, known right. as the Negev. It's a desert. Yes. So, oh. Edom, what? I never knew Petra was in southern. I thought it, oh, I yeah. didn't know the, the, I thought it, actually, I probably thought it was in Lebanon. How? No. no, it's south. It's south of uh, south of uh, Jerusalem. Unless there's another Petra. No, I don't think so. No. But it is nothing but red, like red granite rock with caves. Mm -hmm. They lived in caves. Uh -huh. wow. Thank you, uh, Matt. Yeah, this this helps me, and I don't know if I can get it to copy when I send you the slides. I was unable to do that last week when I sent you the slides and I had some diagrams that didn't, I don't know, they wouldn't copy and I didn't know why. So that helps you see where Edom was and mm -hmm. where that same geographical area is today. Well, you mean it's near, it was, it was Jordan or was it Petra? I, I'm confused. It, uh, Petra is now a city in Jordan Jordan. Then Petra was a city in the kingdom of Edom. Okay, I see so that. The borders changed, but the cities remained. Right. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Mm. Sometimes when the country changes, they change the name of the city, mm -hmm. but the ruins or the city remains. It's right. a long story. I can't get into that. But right. I want you to note where Iraq is and where Syria are now. Right. The borders, yes, the borders may have changed somewhat. Right. So, yeah, Syria, Syria sits right on the uh, Jordan border, and, and they were talking how, how how sad it is because so many families are related, and um, they have family members in Syria and in Jordan both. Hmm. Try to get them back across the border to visit. Well, speaking of time, we're about to run out of, and I try to keep it to an hour. <laughs> We started at 11, we at 10, 15. So mm -hmm. I'm going to wrap this up, but I want to get verse four in here. If Edom says we are shattered, but we will rebuild the ruins. The Lord of hosts says they may build, but I will tear down 
and they will be called the wicked country and the mm -hmm. people with whom the Lord is angry forever. Your own eyes shall see this. And you shall say, great is the Lord beyond the board of Israel, border of Israel. Now, I can't go into everything, but great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel is mm -hmm. to say that in future generations, the Gentiles will come in beyond the border of Israel. But the main part of this is that the people to whom Malachi is speaking, the people of Judah, the people are hearing that there is judgment against this godless nation called Edom. Mm -hmm. None of them ever return, so far as we can tell, uh, to the Lord. If uh, some escaped across the border and came in and became, uh, I don't know, I don't have a word of the Lord on that. But I'm going to mark this as where we, re, uh, re, you know, we got this far today and try to finish chapter one next week. It only has 14 verses and we've done five, but some of them are in big chunks. So read the rest of Malachi chapter one for next week. Okay. And ask the Lord to give you insight and application. Make this more than a Bible study. Make it uh, come into your lives as something that you can grab hold of and take with you. Okay. Find a verse that's especially meaningful or important to you now and say, I see that the Lord is still speaking through Malachi to, to me and to our generation and to our church and to our church leaders. You see, God's word is eternal. The word of the Lord remains how long? Forever. 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 Heaven and earth will pass away. But my word remains forever. Lord yeah. God, put that intent in our hearts to say to you, speak to me and I will listen. Speak to me and I will obey. Speak to me and I will know of my sin and I will know of my Savior. Tell me daily that I am a forgiven sinner. Tell me daily how much you have loved me as you show me and feeding me and clothing me and giving me a roof over my head and protection round about. The holy angels are with me and I am not afraid of anyone or anything. The Lord, you, the Lord, you are my refuge and my strength, a very present help in trouble. And I praise you for being there for me today in the name of Jesus. And in all God's people said, what? Amen. 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 This is what uh, Pastor Clem often, uh, often says.